Hello everybody and welcome to our talk interview discussion on how to see the funny side of life and I have here the amazing Alex Farrow and Alex is um, he's a secondary school teacher he is a philosopher and also he is director of Jericho Comedy and he's an MC and comedian and Jericho Comedy it's a comedy club that I go to as many or I used to before lockdown go to as many Saturdays as I can and I feel quite upset if I miss a Saturday because if I feel I always get FOMO that I've missed some amazing um, comedians and it has recently or um, Early in the year, been uh, Jericho Comedy has been uh, voted or um, as the one of the top five or six comedy clubs in the UK. So I mean, you know, this is just a tiny little comedy club in Oxford, and I, I just feel so lucky to to know Alex and to to um, to be able to go to that weeny weeny little. It's actually very hard to get tickets. You have to be quick. Anyway, so Alex, how to look <laughs> at the funny side of life? How do we do it? I mean, parenting is is tough. I'm not a parent. Not Nor a parent. am I. We were both joking about this before Ooh, we started here. Oh, how do I sound, Marnetta? Can you hear me now? I can't hear you. Take your headphones out. Let's try headphones out. Just carry on and keep how talking that and take your headphones out. Can you hear me now? Does that sound okay? <laughs> I can't oh. hear you. I can't believe that. Just a minute. I'm going to just try and um, sort something out. Is that better? Keep talking. I should. I should definitely. There I, will, you go. I will pretend that everybody can hear me, and so it might flow that way. What are the the, the wonders of uh, this this new world we live in? Eh? Um, oh yeah. Uh, I think the most important to point out is if, if you're a parent and, and watching this, uh, bloody bloody well done. I mean, I can't imagine. Uh, how much extra work these last extra months of things like lockdown will will have been? Uh, as I was saying to you earlier, Marnetta, as a when I was a nanny, um, I, yeah, that was that was too much for me. But at least then I could like leave <laughs> eventually. And as a school teacher, you know, you love your students so much, but like you, they they do stay where you like leave them. They <laughs> you only ever see them at school, and you can. They can leave so mm. yeah both not parents but like yeah. well done well for, for, i mean for, i'm a dog parent and that's yes. hard enough um and he is lovely but at least i can leave him for you know four or five hours <laughs> but with children you're there all the time and they're there as you said in literally needing your attention wanting your attention so that's why i just thought it would be so nice. We've had lots of amazing parenting experts, lots of experts showing us how to self-regulate, help children manage anxiety. But I think sometimes we just need a little bit of fun. We need to relax. We need to let go and see the funny side of life. So, I mean, Alex, why is seeing the funny side so important to you? Uh, I think... Um... I think for me, the really pretentious uh, answer for all stand-up, stand-up comedians are hugely pretentious people. Um, is this about, um, it's about, it's true, it's true, it's true. So it's about uh, self-expression. And so, I mean, I hate, you know, I hate the sort of, is it an art, is it not? But I think the thing that relates to um, looking after children, whether as a teacher, guardian, or parent, something really special, not just for the, the child or the student um but it's something really special for you if you can have that bond where you can be funny where you can share humor with another person i think it's a really um i think it's a kind of skill that we forget in children we think of things like sport and uh, music as being you know part of being a rounded like young person you might sensibly offer lessons in those things um, but I think it's just as important to be able to connect um, and make other people laugh, whether you're an adult or whether you're a young person. Um, I don't think I am ever happier than when I'm laughing and making other people laugh. And I think we uh, are missing out. Our 
as ourselves, as parents or educators, um, and as young people, if we don't have like human response with other people. Um, like if you laugh that, with somebody else. And how does that translate in the classroom? What funny moments and what humour have you had in with your secondary school secondary secondary schoolers? Yeah, yeah, too uh, too much. I mean, I often talk about it um, on stage. Uh, I, I'm trying to think of uh, relatable anecdotes. I'll go. I'll go to a bit of theory first. Um, try, try and keep it as academic for as long as possible. Um, Fine. There's often a, a tension between uh, the teacher as an authority figure and the student as the learner, and I think a lot of people worry. They're like, "Oh, well, what does the what does the teacher have to do with humour? Like, isn't that sort of in some way like either unworkable in the classroom or kind of inappropriate in the classroom? Anyway, uh, I think that as a teacher or parent in that kind of authority position, if you've taught your students or your children uh, like good kind of boundary work, good rules, and you've made those clear, that's a really important part of like a good, well-disciplined classroom. And your students, and good humour is about not crossing lines, but playing about with where they are. And the funniest moments and the best bonds between like teacher and child and parent and child, I think, are when the child knows where those lines are. Um, mm. and once those are really clear and shared and understood, then that's where the two can have lots of humour about kind of the edge of it. And sometimes, uh, I tell you, when I was probably 16, I think it probably was, I remember I was definitely a bit of a joker myself at that stage. I know that. I remember um, we had to do a business and enterprise day and the sort of the local um, kind of business society came in, nice people. I remember there was like a florist and stuff like that came in when I was 16 and we all had to like sell, make a project, you know, Dragon's Den style, make a, a sort of gardening project. I remember for some reason I was very annoyed at having to do this. I just wanted to do like my exams and stuff like that and this felt like a great waste of time. So I remember um, instead of measuring up some garden furniture and designing that all, I remember I was going to make a big sort of anti-capitalist protest. I was going to make my stand. And so I did a joke presentation. I remember I did a, about 10 minutes on um, my company. I remember going up. It's in front of the whole school we had to present and these you know, nice business people. Um, I remember saying that my my garden furniture plan wasn't really furniture at all. But it was actually uh, gnomes. I was going to be selling anarchist garden gnomes. Um, I PowerPointed the faces of all these 19th century anarchist philosophers onto like gnomes, which kind of worked together very well. They, that's quite easy to do. In fact, the head of the gnomes was a chap called Noam Chomsky. Um, you had an electronic one, um, Tamar Trotsky. Anyway. Essentially, I really ripped the this for a very long period of time. Uh, I was expecting the biggest kind of telling off uh, of my life right at the end of the presentation. You know, people were laughing and stuff like that. You know, got a big round of applause at the end. I was like, oh, I'm going to be a detention for the rest of my life. Anyway, the twist of the story, and I've gone over quite a long story. The twist of the story is I got called back up on stage. And I said, Alex, you uh, really impressed us with your uh, presentation. We loved it. Uh, we thought it was a really viral idea. Uh, we love the idea that it was a little bit like Cabbage Patch Dolls, one of the people said. We thought it would go really viral. We thought it was really creative use of the brief. You obviously put loads of effort into it. Anyway, and so it's one of those things that by being kind of humorous, you, you can accidentally be using your brain in a way that mm. actually teachers and, and parents I and stuff like that. that and in the broader world people are, oh well that's actually like a great idea the combination of sort of humor and creativity in the brain mm. is very, very linked humor play creativity all very much so if you're in an educational position you can see how um play humor and creativity if you're working that kind of brain muscle that it you can do accidentally sometimes even like quite clever mm. things I, it really reminds me when I was at university, I, I studied performing arts and for our end of, we had to perform and there was this Rennie, very, probably similar to you, who's very um, anarchic 
uh, Neil, and he, so there was, there's a piece of music called John Cage's Eight and a Half Minutes. Do you, you know that piece? Where John Cage, I think 19, early 19, uh, early 20th century, yeah, um, literally just would turn up and it, it, complete silence. And so for eight and a half minutes. And so he did that and he did it for t baked beans, three baked beans. And so we were just completely laughing and he, <laughs> he, you know, loved it. But it was incredible to see that just like your tutors, they actually said, well, it was great, fantastic, but you didn't do the three sections. <laughs> Because <laughs> this piece of music was meant to be in three sections. So it was like, it was brilliant. But yeah, I love, you know, trying to get that humour or just be a bit different. I really, really like that. So um, how how do you, do you ever use humour with teens in your classes? Okay, occasionally. Uh, there's sometimes jokes that... Um, uh, if you really want to get technical, they're, they're called um, uh, self-reflexive jokes, which are very quick ways of teaching certain types of definition. Um, maybe I could do one now. Uh, I, I sometimes yeah. say um, I'm a big fan of Socratic questions, um, but I never remember the exact definition of Socratic questions. I think it's when you pretend to forget something to help people understand something, and then you tag a question on the end. Ever heard of one of those, Moneta? Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, you can uh, you can sometimes use uh, like play about not knowing definitions and irony and stuff like that if uh, you want to de define things. You have to have a lot of shared knowledge for that sort of stuff. Yes, One of the things is most <laughs> most of the time in a classroom, like it's not me doing a stand up set in front of my students and a lot of the humor comes from the sort of the interactions between them uh, between you and your students and stuff like that um it, the humor tends to emerge when you have a lot of trust between teacher and student um i don't think any student really wants their teacher to be like mucking around um even if you don't like school and stuff like that and so the humor comes from when you're all on the same sort of track. Even if you don't really want to be working that day that much, you sort of, if you trust that your teacher's going to get you through your exams, it's got your best interests in heart, the little asides and the funny humour and stuff like that kind of mm. emerges from that, I think. And knowing mm. when and when it's not appropriate. Normally, humour emerges not from like pre written kind of jokes. We saw, I think we probably saw that a few moments ago, but it tends to come from uh really being on the same kind of wavelength as somebody else if um i know they do uh in sort of social science you can often film conversations and you can you sort of tick when people have been laughing in that conversation it could be a date or it could be um two people sitting at, at a bus stop um the majority of times that people laugh isn't caused by anything that kind of is structured like a joke it's normally laughter normally comes from kind of types of uh, agreement so um uh, if somebody is surprised they're like oh <laughs> hello uh, most like laughter comes from uh things that aren't we don't traditionally think of as uh like sketches comedy humor written jokes and stuff like that mm. it comes from uh, the little surprises and kind of trust you, a, a parent or a teacher will be laughing with their you know student or child because they're both sharing uh, like an experience together I wouldn't be recommending people go home and like you know buy a book on stand-up comedy it's like right I'm gonna become a better parent I'm gonna become a better teacher by like doing that necessarily but the mm. lots of good teaching ends up being the case that you kind of have laughter like if you ask your students for like good examples of things they will find examples that you hadn't thought of and they'll be really mm. left field and that will make you laugh and stuff like that yeah so like because humor is such a tricky one isn't it because it can you can be so off like you know traditionally the the, the stag party where the best man you know that is the 
the most hilarious thing when you see, isn't it? Uh, of the, the best man's speech just being excruciatingly awful. It's okay, us watching, but for the people who, whose wedding it is, it's really not funny. Um, it's great from the outside. So humour, we have to be really, really careful with, you know, it's that it's not, it's 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 clean in that it's done with love and, and, and connection rather than, because I noticed you, because you are a brilliant, I hope you don't mind me saying, you are a brilliant MC, because you, in fact, when I watch you, you do the warm up and I sort of half of me feels I just want to watch you for, for the whole time, just interacting with everybody because it's just and, and when you when you finished and it's on for the first act, which is great. Um, I was like, oh, we could have more of that because you're <laughs> building a really r lovely rapport with with the audience and you're just picking out what they're wearing, who they've come with, something funny they say. And like, you know, how do you do that? How could how can we do that more? Um, so I think how can we good, build, use humour to build a connection. So I think good connections with others, whether that's in a stand-up comedy club or in a conversation uh, with anyone. Uh, I think I always think of jokes and as being kind of little stories. And so over, um, I don't know if you remember that how old was he really he was probably about 14 he was wasn't he 14 and he was a friend 14. of mine <laughs> yeah there was a, a young young lad probably a bit too young we normally say 16 plus at the gig but this young lad had kind of but he was tall his work. mother said oh he'll get in he looks 16 oh, yeah, yeah. i knew i knew immediately anyway and well as soon as i saw him i suppose part of what was so funny about having him in was that you you set up a game and so I was like right i know that this I know what the game is, that he's snuck in and he needs to stay in and I will draw out how long he wants to play this game. And so he, I said, oh, you're, you're 16. Oh, that's, that's great. Like, what are you what are you studying for A-level? Anyway, obviously it, he made some stuff up. I can't think he, did he make up too many subjects? He was studying like he, six things at A-level or something, right? He just, he was like a, he was a rabbit in the headlights. He didn't know what to say. Or didn't he say geography or French? And then you well, got he said, to well, say, he said French, oh, didn't he? French? And then, then it was obviously a great opportunity to get him to do some French. Um, lucky, I'm lucky enough to know a little bit of French. Anyway, and so the, the, obviously the more he struggled, um, the funnier it got, um, oh. because he knew he couldn't not play. Anyway, so it was very, very funny. Eventually I sort of, kind of let him off and let him kind of sit But right you now. did it with such, you know, it was, it was funny because you did it, it was the way that you did it with such heart and love and not malice or putting down it didn't feel you know there are you know like maybe a jimmy carr type would have done it in a in quite a terse way but the way that it was done it was even funnier because we were we were with him and we were with you so that's what i mean about connection you managed to get uh, and he'll never forget that <laughs> We'll I think I think one way to see conversations sometimes is as games, right? And so maybe I didn't convey that well with that kind of example, um, but I think that's how I think about it sometimes. And so there was a game that was going to be set up with us, and the reason it didn't seem mean was I allowed him to play each time. So each time right. he put forward like a new theory about why he was 16, that was really funny. And if I just cut that and shut that down, too quickly. I mean, I, I could have said some very funny, very mean things to shut that down, but it was so much funnier to, to let him demonstrate to everybody that he really wasn't. Um, by, and so, but it's when you see conversations as games or like um, all sorts of jokes as kind of play, everybody's got to be equal in the, in the game. If somebody doesn't want to play the game, it's horrible to watch, particularly with sort of mm. crowd work and a stand up comedy club. It's so it's really disappointing to know so many people. Um, it's often people's worst nightmare to want to sit in the front of a comedy club because they think they're going to be bullied. Essentially, people expect it, and it's ah, oh, it breaks my heart um, because it's it mm. should be so fun um, and mm. the, there's a game between you and the audience member, and it's not mm. about and a fun game involves playing with somebody who who's an equal partner in it, and you don't mm. sort of like. Dominated. It's much more fun to watch. 
definitely. So, and do, so, so yeah, I think that's okay. my point on that. So as a, you know, as a human being, do you consciously not not you know with the comedian aside, do you consciously go out looking for? Uh, okay, I'm going to backtrack. One thing that, that Jericho comedy, that's why I particularly love it, is that it supports all the profits go to Oxford Mind. So there is such a link, and that's why I brought you on because there is such a link with your. Um, your passion in a way and purpose for supporting mental health and and so so that's that was uh, that's a yeah, yeah that's I, mean, I mean so about that. i think it's uh, the, i'd love to talk about mind and the good work that kind of mind does um uh, mind as a charity is as is it lots of things everything from uh, uh signposting to essential services to make sure people in need and crisis don't fall through the cracks to having things like um the crisis center a sort of an a an a and e for people in having a mental health crisis when actual a and e couldn't be more inappropriate sometimes so they do huge amounts of work like that mm. and i think that um i think all i think all comedians are always fascinated by uh mental health i think i think mm. to be a I think to be funny it involves kind of knowing yourself very well, Absolutely. Uh, mm. you know, and so you spend a lot of time kind of looking inwards. And for mm. some people, if you spend too much time looking inwards, you don't always find funny things. You find things that are a little bit hard sometimes. And so um, uh, I think that's what makes you authentic. Sort of almost like professional interest in mental health. Yeah, but you can see the authenticity of a comedian that has done that work and has you know almost making fun of what makes them different and it, it's really really lovely so but the other side of it is is it something do you consciously as a as a human look for the funny side in life are you always on the lookout for looking for funny things or does it just appear or do you just see them how does that work for for me personally uh, so every comedian is on a scale from there are some who, who comedians that I am very jealous of who just never give it any conscious time. They're just walking around all the time. The funny stuff will happen. They'll just kind of like write it down and remember it to uh, probably me. I, I think very consciously about it. Yeah, I sit down with it like a bit of paper. I do like homework. Mm. Maybe I've been in education too long. I sit down and mm. do like my comedy homework. I will uh like think back across my week things that make me laugh and like i'll write in a very like structured way when i'm writing like whole shows or stand up i'll write with other people as well which is um and for other people which is really like homework because mm. they've had something that they need to write for or um that's happened to them and they're like right i really want to talk about this and you're like okay right let's 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 work on this mm. then and so that, that can be a very it can be a very academic exercise, um, but it can also be like the complete opposite where uh, you just got, I mean, I know there are some people who like, very consciously do things because they know, they just know they'll be funny. Um, like the comedian Mark Thomas, uh, for example, goes around, uh, you, if you've ever heard of him, and he will be like, right, I'm going to do a campaign and like the, the humour comes from the activity. It could be, I don't know. I said, I can't, you know, off the top of my head, I can't actually remember any of it, but it could be, um, it's like pranks almost, isn't it, on, but for a political yes. point. And so yes. you can m make your sort of life and the humour sort of merge together very much like that. Or mm. you can you can have it as an outlet where you pour it into uh, writing. Um, mm. Certainly the more frequently you watch comedy, and the more that you spend time writing or, or consciously doing it, the more funny things you do see around you. Um, mm. So the, if you do put lots of humorous experiences into your head, your life becomes funnier. You sort of you begin to think in a, in a kind of a funny way stuff. The, the comedian Russell Howard said to me that really stuck with me. I don't know if it'll stick with any anybody else. He said that when he found stand up, his whole life became funny, um, just because there was suddenly an outlet for it. He would he right. was never he was never bored again. Any negative experience, any 
um, any experience at all could be repurposed by him and, and used later on that evening to entertain mm. people. Right? So yes. It revolutionised his life, made everything like funny. Um, he get, stand up gets very addictive, very yeah. for that reason. Oh, really? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We got, and you also never know because it's you know live. You never know whether it's going to work, whether you're going to be the hero of the evening, and then sometimes you're not. You're the zero. Are you going to die? Because yeah. you, because it, it, you, you can quite easily die on stage. Yeah. But you, and it, and it comes to us all, whatever level uh, you're at. But it, that's what makes it so addictive that you could, that it could be the best time ever, or it could be the worst. Yeah. And it's yeah. the not knowing. It's almost like sort of the gambler's addiction or whatever. Yeah. And so, like so, stand comedy in itself uh, might, in some ways, not be the most good for mental health um, for some people, anyway. So, because mm -hmm. a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure in that moment. Yeah. So, have you? Just to sort of like finish the last few minutes, have you got some funny stories of working with teens that you? Uh, my well, my funniest one at the moment uh, is Ben. So I think I told you about Ben um, on stage at Toad. Ben, I, I've changed his name. It's not Ben. I'm a I'm a nice guy. But anyway, let's call him Ben. One of my students. <laughs> He's been peanutted a lot by the some of the other students. Makes his tie go sort of in. Sort of really tight, and you can't undo it. So I thought, oh, do you know what, Ben? Like, you can't be having this happen. I'm going to help you out. So I make him this trapezium of wood from the DT department. I'm like, Let's put this in your tie, mate. And this is going to solve your problem. Obviously, it didn't solve the problem at all. Uh, I quite literally made him a square. Um, and so uh, it didn't help at all. So the tie gets pulled. But apparently they were doing this thing that's called granddadding, where you hit someone in the leg and they don't walk very well. Anyway, and Ben's like, Mr. Farrow, I really liked what you did with the, the tie thing. I'm like, I don't think it was a good idea, Ben. I think it was a really bad idea. And I really like what you did, Mr. Farrow. Uh, and I've got a new solution. Anyway, he, he got some more bits of MDF and put them down, <laughs> down his trousers to stop people hitting that. I'm like... Ben, you, you're going to be in, at this rate. You're going to be enclosed in a single massive big box. <laughs> We're not going to know you're in it. You're going to be like some sort of Schrodinger student. Whether you're going to, you're going to be there or not there. Anyway, it's one of those things that like children are just funny. Um, yeah. I I could add jokes to that or whatever. Like just Ben's thinking there, just so yeah. me so deeply, deeply, deeply funny. Um, he's you know he's sorted himself out he's taking the wood out of his trousers now but uh, <laughs> just so it's just and as a teacher as well you can't you know you're not, you're not supposed to laugh all the time and so you have to like like ben i i just really don't think you should have to have that wood down your trousers he's like no no but i think it's a good idea no <laughs> don't do that please ben. No, it yeah. must be such great fun being with those teenagers and having that humor but as you said they, they need to respect you so you're not a pranker you're not running around and being stupid with them but you're you're really on their side you're really supportive but you're helping them just lighten up a bit aren't you yeah you see the yeah. Side, and, yeah and when you've got that good relationship with a student relationship. uh they can open up to you and they can tell you about things like that they do need help with like Obviously, yeah. if somebody is pulling somebody's tie too much, you as a teacher need to know. You need to know whether that's something that needs yeah. adult intervention. Actually, probably with Ben, it, it did. And we did. Yeah. And that's why he doesn't have to have wood down yeah. the trousers anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, but sometimes without, have, without being approachable, you can sometimes lose that. Mm. And it's, as I was trying mm. to say at the beginning, comedy is all about uh, lines and sort of boundaries and knowing that as a teacher people can approach you that your boundary that your line isn't too impersonal yet they also yeah. know that when the joke goes too far the game stops sort of thing and so it's, it's a really tough one comedy is is really tough and you're in a very, very tough business but it's good it's good all in the name of fun laughter and good mental health yeah thank you alex that was oh, really nice right. to talk to you. Thank yeah, you. Absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you. Thank you.
Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.